guess we're all here. Um, for anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Elaine Kohler, K3VQR. And as you recall, last month the club, the Murgas Amateur Radio Club, celebrated its 45th anniversary. And while we were discussing some plans for that, some of the newer members were asking, why did the club get started? How did they do it? And had some questions about that. So I started going through some of the old minutes, which I will admit is not always easy. They are handwritten on notebook papers. Some of them are in pencil, so you kind of, after 45 years, you have to really look hard to see what's on these pages. But that done, I managed to do that. And I also contacted some of our longtime club members. And they have very graciously agreed to write down some of their memories. Um, some of them did recordings for me, uh, voice recordings. So uh, I hope that we can kind of um, elaborate on the history that we have on file and make it available to more people. Um, I'd also like to thank all of the older members who actually uh, you know, helped uh, make those memories or help write down those memories and record them. Uh, that was really helpful. Um, so I thought when I first started through this that I was going to have uh, you know, trouble finding enough material, but I found out that I, I really had to limit myself because there's a lot of information out there. So I'm primarily going to talk about the first six months of meetings that the club had. Okay, I'll figure out how to do this with this fancy thing here. Okay, so the two questions we're going to try and answer tonight is, uh, why was the club started and how did it grow? <clears throat> now, in order to understand where the uh, club was at this time, we have to get into our time machine and go back to the 1970s. So, in 1975 is the particular year that we're looking at and disco was just becoming popular. This is actually a picture from Saturday Night Live, which wasn't released until 1977. But this was the era that we were living in. The top selling songs in 1975 were Love Will Keep Us Together by Captain and Tennille, and Rhinestone Cowboy by Glenn Campbell. And if we had playlists at those, that time, they would not be in my top 10. The top rated TV shows were All in the Family and Laverne and Shirley. And the movie Jaws was released that year. Gerald Ford was president. The Vietnam War ended. The Watergate trials continued. Jimmy Hoffa was reported missing. The Steelers played the Vikings in the Super Bowl games, and they won 16 to 6. Saturday Night Live aired its first show, and Bill Gates used the word Microsoft for the first time. It stood for microprocessor software. In 1975, computers were not readily available to the average person. They had them in the military, some of the colleges had them, businesses were starting to use them, but the home computer was a new idea. There was no internet, so consequently you had no email, you had no Google, you had no Facebook. There were no cell phones, there was no texting. If you left your house and you had to get in touch with somebody, you better hope you could find a payphone and you remember to take a quarter or a dime with you or you couldn't call anybody. And that was a favorite thing that moms told their teenage girls, make sure you have a quarter with you to call your, be able to call home. So if you had an amateur radio, a handheld, you could see the advantages that you would have being out in your car or being at a store or a parking lot. You could actually talk to somebody else. We did have electricity, despite what my grandsons think. Um, we did have radio and TV. Newspapers were a very important communication at this time, and also snail mail. You'll see uh, when you read through the uh, minutes that they did a lot of letter writing, congratulating people, thanking people, receiving letters from people. It was the way co people communicated at that time. Local hams congregated at Al's Surplus Store in Hanover Township. You, you can pick yourself out on that photo. Uh, they talked to one another on the air. So there was a loose association of the amateurs. It was a popular thing to do on Saturday morning. They'd go down, have coffee, see what Al had, and shoot the breeze, so to speak. And there was this idea that, yeah, maybe we should start to form some kind of a club, make it a little more formal. Then in 1972, the floods from Hurricane Agnes devastated the Wyoming Valley. And this is a picture of the Market Street Bridge. You can see the water almost to the top of the bridge. 
And this is the infamous boat people. This is downtown Wilkes-Barre where people were being evacuated. So you had thousands of people who were taken out of their homes in shelters. You had power interrupted. You had telephones interrupted. People had no way to find out where their families were. The only uh, way they were actually reading off, off lists on the uh, radio stations and TV, these are the people who are, who are at this shelter. Or people would call in and say, could you make an announcement and see if you could find Walter Scott anywhere? So there was really no way of, of letting people know where their families were. Some of the amateurs did uh, take their handhelds and go to the Red Cross. I believe Charlie uh, was one of those people who showed up at the Red Cross, and he was able to get some word out to other people who had their handhelds. So there's no formal organization in 1972. Then in 1974, Hurricane Eloise threatened the Wyoming Valley again. People were told to be ready to eva evacuate, pack your bags, be ready to go at a moment's notice. Now, fortunately, we didn't have that much flooding and the evacuation wasn't necessary. But it got the hams thinking, this is two times within two years that we possibly have faced evacuation. We better get our act together. So uh, they wanted to be better, better prepared for emergencies and in disasters. So on November 14th, or November 14th, November 7th, 1974, the first meeting at Pomeroy's conference room was held. There are 14 amateurs attended. Um, temporary officers were elected, and they were Stan Shina, uh, Al, K3B, LAB, and recording secretary was Carl Kohler, K3JML. And they talked about what they wanted to do with this club. Did they want to be a club that was going to be a repeater association? Did they want to be a DXing club? And they, after discussing it, they decided that for now, to get started, they were just going to be a fraternal organization. They were going to be a bunch of amateurs who just came together to enjoy their hobby. They needed to find a more permanent meeting place, so they were going to ask Charlie Hooker if they would be able to use the Westminster Church. And Joe, do you want to add any of your comments here at this point? That's pretty much exactly what I was going to say. Okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm, <laughs> there's, the, the history is the history. Do you want to handle the next meeting? Well, I, I can, can Yeah, come on up, Joe. Yeah. Um, Joe did a lot of work putting things together here, too. Oops. Yeah. You gave the, the list of the people that were here. Good evening, um, everybody. My name is Joe Smalley. I'm WA3CKA, um, one of the original people that uh, got this group going together. Uh, yeah, Charlie Hooker was at the second meeting, Reverend uh, Charlie Hooker. He was the pastor of the Westminster Presbyterian Church on Hanover Street in uh, Wilkesbury, and he offered the use of the auditorium, which was a big asset because uh, we didn't have a permanent place at that time. We didn't have a name yet at that time. Um, the next meeting was held on December 4th. Yeah, I have that one here. Um, yeah, you have that one there already. And... Uh, Discussion was what what we're going to name this club, and uh, our officers, how do you elect them? We didn't know any procedures whatsoever. Fortunately, um, there was a, a member of the club by the name of uh, Campbell Collins, who was a lawyer, and he helped with many many of the uh, legal aspects that needed to be addressed to get the club going. And uh, can I add one thing? To yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, also on, oh, oops. <laughs> oh, sorry. That's okay. Um, on, also at this meeting, uh, they had cons uh, copies of the Constitution from two other clubs in the area, yeah. the Anthracite Repeater Association and the Lackawanna Valley Repeater Association. And they had uh, different kinds of um, memberships and things like that, and that's where they got some of their ideas for yeah. what they were going to um, okay. Uh, be discussing. So between the D November meeting and the December meeting, they had actually managed to come up with a preliminary constitution, which I think is pretty amazing that in three weeks yeah. they could yeah. actually, not yeah. only did they come up with it, they actually had it typed up, which I think Charlie's secretary probably did, yeah. typed it up and had it photocopied or mimeographed, whatever, and ready to hand out so they could go through it point by point at this meeting and make changes where they uh, need, were needed. And what they did was they just voted on everything. Every point that came up, they put it up to a vote, majority ruled, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah we, we, were, we were all learning because uh, no one belonged to a radio club or any organization like that. 
but those attending the uh, initial get-togethers, if you want to call them, up at uh, Pomeroy's at the mall, uh, was K3ETN, Stan, K3OMF, Joe, K3JML, Carl, K3LAB, Al, WA3CKA, that would be me, K3DYU, Ed, WA3CPV, Bob, and uh, K3HHA, Chet, WA3PZO, Pete Jr., W3KTO, Pete, WA3JWV, Bob, WA3LYF, Roy, WA3JVS, and John, WA3LLS. Some of these people have passed on, unfortunately, but uh, some of them I knew personally, and some of them I, I just knew them casually from uh, starting the club. Uh, do you have you want to go further with what you have, or want me to continue here? Where were you going next? Okay, well, I was going to go. Uh, Father Murgas was a uh, a very uh, well. That, let me let me back up here. Uh, Mr. Collins uh, brought up at one of the meetings that uh, uh, Father Murgas, a local priest at uh, uh, in Wilkesbury up on uh, North Main Street at Sacred Heart, was a very uh, active radio experimenter at the turn of the century. And he did a demonstration between Wilkesbury and Scranton of uh, the capabilities of radio. Marconi came to see what his setup was, and I guess he was quite impressed. But uh, um, as, as things progressed, the the uh, uh, Campbell Collins brought up the article about uh, Father Burgos, and it was kicked around quite a bit with regard to whether we should name the club after an individual. Uh, there were a lot of people that were against it, but the uh, the vote went in favor of naming the club the Burgos Amateur Radio Club, and so that was it. We didn't have a uh, uh, a need for a call sign at that particular time, and uh, I won't I won't mention whose call whose whose call K3 YTO. You probably can guess who it was. Uh, it's this see, sometime in 1975. A discussion came up about a reenactment of what Father Murgas did at the turn of the century. A committee was formed to see if the priest and the passioner, passion, uh, parishioners at Sacred Heart would uh, ha like to have something like this here done. Uh, a committee was formed to see the priest, and the, uh, the response was a resounding yes. I never uh, experienced such a uh, enthusiastic group of people as we did at uh, Sacred Heart Church. Uh, the, respond, the response was a resounding yes. Father Morgas was a revered individual uh, by the par parishioners of that day, plus the parishioners from way back. Uh, as they say it today, it went viral. Okay. <laughs> the, the, this event was to coincide with the United States 200 year anniversary of the bicentennial. Our club gathered equipment for the presentation. Dignitaries from Wilkesbury and Scranton were uh, contacted, as well as political members on both ends of the circuit. The uh, other station was in Scranton. Uh, my call sign was used, and my two-meter radio was used. We, there weren't too many people that had two-meter radios uh, at that point in time. I had an HR2A, uh, six crystal control, six channels, <laughs> and it ran 15 watts. We had a borrowed uh, beam up on the second floor in the, in the school's auditorium. And uh, the other station was on the south side of Scranton, up somewhere around uh, where River Street and Stafford Avenue is. But we had, a, we had the location at uh, the uh, a hotel on Meadow Avenue. We got permission to, to uh, set up a station up there. And uh, everything went well. It was, it was a very, very well, very well uh, orchestrated uh, presentation and the people the auditorium was filled you couldn't get another seat another person in the place and uh, it, it, was, it was it was just a great it was a great experience it was all brand new to all of us none of us had any kind of experience doing that thing so we did it by the seat of our pants and it, it came out pretty good uh, the club had a variety of skilled members we had uh, electronic technicians uh, electronic engineers doctors lawyers many of the trade groups were there so there was always somebody available to help you solve a problem. Uh, another suggestion at a meeting was to build a replica of the uh, twin towers that Father Murgas used to support his original antennas. 
they were located uh, in the area near the President Church. And I've all, I'm, I'm sure you've all have seen the, the public club's call sign. It's quite impressive. Um, somebody that worked at the Intermetro over on uh, North Washington Street, I think it was, got permission to build uh, replicas of these two towers out of stainless steel. Uh, there was members in the club that uh, were masons. They built the uh, pedestal that was installed by the, the rectory on that property, and uh, the towers were were installed. And it's quite impressive. If I haven't been that way in quite a while, so I don't know if it's still standing, but it would be nice to go and take a look at it. Uh, some of the activities that the club got involved in Harry Thomas and I started CW training classes in the basement of the uh, church and they, they were very successful. We got uh, quite a few new hams to join the club because of it. There was also uh, people that were teaching the uh, technical aspects of the requirements for the testing and that, that always went well. Um, that, that's pretty much well. See, one of the highlights of, of, of the uh, CW classes, we had a, a young lady by the name of Arlene Conigal. She was blind, and uh, she would come to the uh, CW meetings, which were every week we had a, a class, and she would bring her Braille writer with her. And I, I can still hear that mechanical machine as she copied the code that Harry or I was sending to her at that time. So it was, it was a great experience. And, uh, uh, lots of lots of things happened with the club. There was so much going on all the time that it, it, it was a busy time. It was a busy time for the first 10 years. It was very busy. That that pretty much brings me up to, uh, then the club got into ham fest and contesting and all that kind of things. And, you know, it, it was a great experience. And I'm still happy to be a part of the group. Okay, that's, thanks. that's it. Okay, yeah, thank th you. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. <laughs> okay, so then in January, they continued, uh, we've got the uh, Constitution adopted, and in January they went over the bylaws, and I'm just going to run through a couple of them, because these are things that we pretty much still do today, uh, 45 years later. Uh, only regular members can vote on issues and elect officers. At least two-thirds of those present must approve a new membership application. The first Wednesday of the month is still our uh, meeting date except for legal holidays. Now this is very interesting about dues, $2.40, that's a year, yeah. that, and that's a year, not a month, that's for the whole year, $2.40. They made provisions for the club property with having a quartermaster and it had to, uh, equipment had to be signed in and out, and they weren't finished with the bylaws yet, but it was 10 um, 1018, so they decided to adjourn. Uh, then in the next meeting in February, they did complete the uh, bylaws, and Colin Campbell's, uh, Campbell Collins, I always get that wrong, K through YTL suggested naming the club after Father Murgas. And after some debate, as Joe said, and you can see this in the minute, it was quite contentious. People were arguing that they shouldn't name a club after a person, and other people said, uh, wanted to form a committee, and they said, why do you need a committee? We're here, we could vote. And so someone finally made a motion to come up with the Murgas Amateur Radio Club. It was seconded, nobody had any other suggestions, and it was voted in. And then the first thing they did was to elect officers. Um, so the president was Charlie Hooker, Vice President Stan China, Carl was the uh, uh, secretary, and Ed Lucas was the treasurer. Um, a motion was made then by all the people who were there who wished to become members to form the desire and be accepted. So I'm just imagining that Charlie probably, and Walt can probably tell this, how Charlie went about getting club members. I guess you all raised your hand. You all raised your hand and said you wanted to be a club member and you were in. Um, and then John Obick suggested that the club start a scrapbook, and thank God he did because we still have the scrapbook. It's been kept up over the years. Uh, Bob Michael and 3FA did a lot of keeping it up. So I brought it along tonight to show everyone. <laughs> now, this is a nice thing that happens. You're going along and you're reading the minutes and all of a sudden you skip a month and you have no idea why. Uh, this was a loose leaf notebook that they kept in the first couple of years, so who knows? The secretary wasn't there, the meeting was canceled, we don't know. But when they got to the ledger book, at least if the meeting was canceled or there wasn't a secretary, they would actually make a note. 
Uh, but at this meeting, I'm guessing that committees were formed because at the April meeting, they had all kinds of reports. Uh, Campbell Collins was looking into a club logo. Uh, he was trying to see if Father Murgus had a design they could incorporate. There was a training committee, which Joe and Harry, they were gathering materials and equipment. And people were loaning them equipment for this class. They didn't have things that they went out and bought. And that's one thing that came through through the minutes, too. There was a lot of generosity. People were donating things to the club to do projects. Um, they didn't actually list the members because apparently there was a whole list of people. Uh, we don't have the list, but a whole list of people were approved for new membership. They established the post office box as a permanent address, and they, commit, uh, they started the committee for the Murgas uh, reenactment. And they discussed having door prizes at the meeting, uh, meetings because at this point, the club is pretty much broke. Uh, they have about $75, $80 in their treasury. So uh, they had to get permission from the church to be able to use door prizes. Then in May, they had another list of prospective members. So you can see, I'm guessing there may be 10, 20 people on these lists. Do you know, Joe? No, I don't, I don't see So there was just a list of people, again, that were uh, approved. They had a publicity report. They had the training committee report. Door prizes were approved. And they came up with an executive committee. Now remember, at this time, there was no board of directors. It was just the four officers. So they had um, three people who were added to a committee to give the um, meet and come back with ideas for the club of different things that they could do. They established a membership committee that was appointed not only to go out and recruit new members, but it was supposed to verify the qualifications of uh, members who applied uh, for membership. How they did that, I don't know. There was no computer that you went and put a call sign in and you could find out if somebody was a member. So whether they made them bring their license in and show it to them, I, I don't know. Do you have any idea, Joe? No? OK. And then they were asked to uh, sponsor communications for a bike race. And Walt WA3YOE, who is now W3, WN3LIF, was appointed at uh, the coordinator. And they later refund Father Murgas's grave later in the month to honor uh, the anniversary of his death. And uh, June 4th, the commemoration committee was established, as you can see there. Now, these people thought big. And they did get involved with the Bicentennial Committee. The um, United States was going to be celebrating its 200th anniversary the following year. So there was a bic Bicentennial Committee that was already uh, established and doing things. And so they got in touch with them. And the uh, Bicentennial Committee actually paid for some of the dignitaries that were invited to stay in town. Uh, they invited lo the, all the local people, the um, and mayors, the uh, county commissioners. They invited our state representatives and senators. They invited the people who went down to Washington. Of course, Dan Flood was there. Now, they, they thought really big, and they invited Barry Goldwater, who was an amateur radio operator. He was, had run for president, and then he was now a senator. But unfortunately, he couldn't come. This, I don't know how well you're seeing this. This is the first training class picture. 50 people showed up for their first training class, which I think is amazing. And then it goes on. Um, I'm not going to go on to this very much because this is just going through some of the uh, things. One thing I wanted to show you, field day in 1979. This was the food order. <laughs> 50 pounds of hamburgers, 20 pounds of hot dogs, two halves of beer, and a quarter keg of birch beer. <laughs> so, and they had about 40 people there, so I guess it was justified. I've gone through finding some of the locations about where field days were held in VHF contests, but due to the late hour, I'm going to sk uh, skip coming about some of that. Uh, here's some highlights. In 1977, they um, received their ARRL certification. 1983, they started a silent key plaque to honor members who had passed, and they also got their special services club designation. In the, uh, 1984, they started a Ham of the Year award, but they didn't actually give out the award to the following year. And just as a point of interest, in 1988, uh, lightning had struck the church steeple three times since the quad antenna was installed. And they were, the church was asked the club if it could be taken down. So just some comments and enter, uh, that I observed. 
there was, a, as Joe said, so much energy and enthusiasm came through the minutes. Um, when they asked for volunteers to do something, there'd be three or four people would assign themselves to a committee. There was a real can-do spirit about these people, and I guess they were part of that greatest generation that they could go out and do uh, anything. And as I said before, there was a lot of generosity, a lot of people donating their equipment or loaning equipment for classes. And one final comment if I could make. We have 45 years of records. Um, a lot of them are starting to get a little faded, get a little weak, and I would really like to see the club find a way to preserve them, if we could scan them and digitize. I know Walt has been kind of working on this project, so I hope if they come up with a way that we can do this, it's something that the club would really consider uh, taking on as a project. I'd be interesting for everybody, I think, to be able to read through the minutes as I have. I think you'd find some really interesting things in there. Any questions? Yes? What was the actual year of the recreation? Was it 75 or 76 of the Mervis transmission? Uh, they did it in 1975 in November. And I forgot, was that the 90th year maybe? I forgot what year it was. And they, they redid it several times since then. Uh, two other times it's been done. So, yeah. yeah. And they've had special uh, event stations two or three times for it also. And the, those pictures are in the, uh, in the uh, scrapbook there. If you want to see them, it, it lists all the different recreations that they've done. Phil? What was the original call sign of the club? K3YTL. Yeah. It didn't have a call sign before that. Oh. Yeah. They were just getting into, um, Kyle, uh, Kyle, Campbell Collins passed away in February of 1976, oh. and they were just at that time starting to, they were going to do field day in the VHF contest, and they were thinking about getting a call sign, and then when he passed away, they thought it would be appropriate to have his call sign reassigned. Oh. So. What was the high water mark of our membership? Are, are um, by the, this was interesting. By the end of 1977, they had 112 members. So in two years, they had grown that much. I think probably the highlight was more like in the 1980s. I think at one point there was 120-some members. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, too, the ham fest. Um, I can go back to it here. The ham fest... Uh, amount of money. The first time they uh, worked with the uh, ham, oh, back one more, with the Brock, they made $341.82. And then they continued on, and by the time they were up to 1992, they had made $5,000 up at the, up at Dallas. So, big difference. So. Quick, uh, a little bit more expensive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, money was different. Kyle. Uh, for the uh, field day? Yeah. There was two halves of beer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Kyle, you don't know. Well, well, that was like half the question. Because yeah. I noticed that in the bylaws, it's like <coughs> you can't have alcohol beverages at club events. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they weren't, they weren't supposed to have them. <laughs> they weren't supposed to. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was an incident at Moon Lake Park one day. Um, they, they had this nice old, you know, park ranger who kind of just looked the other way. And they were discreet about it, you know, they didn't have open containers and so forth. And they had a new guy come in one summer. And he made the rounds and found the keg of beer and said, I'm coming back at midnight and it better all be gone. Well, of course, rather than throw it away, they had to drink it. <laughs> yes, they enjoyed that ham fest very much, or that field day very much, I should say. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, thanks, everybody. Sorry for the late hour.